Penguin Random House Audio presents Brief Answers to the Big Questions by Stephen Hawking. Read for you by Ben Wishaw. With an introduction read by Garrick Hagen and an afterword read by Lucy Hawking. A note from the publisher. Stephen Hawking was regularly asked for his thoughts on the big questions of the day by scientists, tech entrepreneurs, senior business figures, political leaders, and the general public. Stephen maintained an enormous personal archive of his responses, which took the form of speeches, interviews, and essays. This book draws from this personal archive and was in development at the time of his death. It has been completed in collaboration with his academic colleagues, his family, and the Stephen Hawking estate. A percentage of the royalties will go to charity. An Introduction by Professor Kip S. Thorne I first met Stephen Hawking in July 1965 in London, England, at a conference on general relativity and gravitation. Stephen was in the midst of his Ph.D. studies at the University of Cambridge. I had just completed mine at Princeton University. Rumors swirled around the conference halls that Stephen had devised a compelling argument that our universe must have been born at some finite time in the past. It cannot be infinitely old. So, along with some one hundred people, I squeezed into a room designed for forty to hear Stephen speak. He walked with a cane, and his speech was a bit slurred, but otherwise he showed only modest signs of the motor neuron disease with which he had been diagnosed just two years earlier. His mind was clearly unaffected. His lucid reasoning relied on Einstein's general relativity equations and on astronomers' observations that our universe is expanding and on a few simple assumptions that seemed very likely to be true and it made use of some new mathematical techniques that Roger Penrose had recently devised. Combining all these in ways that were clever, powerful, and compelling, Stephen deduced his result. Our universe must have begun in some sort of singular state, roughly ten billion years ago. Over the next decade, Stephen and Roger, combining forces, would go on to prove, ever more convincingly, this singular beginning of time, and also prove, ever more convincingly, that the core of every black hole is inhabited by a singularity where time ends. I emerged from Stephen's 1965 lecture tremendously impressed, not just by his argument and conclusion, but more importantly, by his insightfulness and creativity. So I sought him out and spent an hour talking privately with him. That was the beginning of a lifelong friendship, a friendship based not just on common science interests, but on a remarkable mutual sympathy, an uncanny ability to understand each other as human beings. Soon we were spending more time talking about our lives, our loves, and even death, than about science, though our science was still much of the glue that bound us together. In September 1973, I took Stephen and his wife Jane to Moscow, Russia. Despite the raging Cold War, I had been spending a month or so in Moscow every other year since 1968, collaborating on research with members of a group led by Yakov Parisovich Zeldovich. Zeldovich was a superb astrophysicist and also a father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. Because of his nuclear secrets, he was forbidden to travel to Western Europe or America. He craved discussions with Stephen. He could not come to Stephen, so we went to him. In Moscow... Stephen wowed Zeldovich and hundreds of other scientists with his insights, and in return Stephen learned a thing or two from Zeldovich. Most memorable was an afternoon that Stephen and I spent with Zeldovich and his Ph.D. student Alexei Starobinsky 
in Stephen's room in the Rossiya Hotel. Zeldovich explained, in intuitive ways, a remarkable discovery they had made. And Starobinsky explained it mathematically. To make a black hole spin requires energy. We already knew that. A black hole, they explained, can use its spin energy to create particles. And the particles will fly away, carrying the spin energy with them. This was new and surprising, but not terribly surprising. When an object has energy of motion, nature usually finds a way to extract it. We already knew other ways of extracting a black hole's spin energy. This was just a new, though unexpected, way. Now, the great value of conversations like this is that they can trigger new directions of thought. And so it was with Stephen. He mulled over the zeldovich starobinsky discovery for several months, looking at it first from one direction and then from another, until one day it triggered a truly radical insight in Stephen's mind. After a black hole stopped spinning, the hole can still emit particles. It can radiate, and it radiates as though the black hole was hot, like the sun, though not very hot, just mildly warm. The heavier the hole, the lower its temperature. A hole that weighs as much as the sun has a temperature of 0.0000006 Kelvin, 0.06 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. The formula for calculating this temperature is now engraved on Stephen's headstone in Westminster Abbey in London, where his ashes reside between those of Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. This hawking temperature of a black hole and its hawking radiation, as they came to be called, were truly radical. Perhaps the most radical theoretical physics discovery in the second half of the 20th century. They opened our eyes to profound connections between general relativity, black holes, thermodynamics, the physics of heat, and quantum physics, the creation of particles where before there were none. For example, they led Stephen to prove that a black hole has entropy, which means that somewhere inside or around the black hole there is enormous randomness. He deduced that the amount of entropy, the logarithm of the hole's amount of randomness, is proportional to the hole's surface area. His formula for the entropy is engraved on Stephen's memorial stone at Gonvalin Keys College in Cambridge, where he worked. For the past 45 years, Stephen and hundreds of other physicists have struggled to understand the precise nature of a black hole's randomness. It is a question that keeps on generating new insights about the marriage of quantum theory with general relativity. That is about the ill-understood laws of quantum gravity. In autumn 1974, Stephen brought his Ph.D. students and his family, his wife Jane and their two children, Robert and Lucy, to Pasadena, California for a year, so that he and his students could participate in the intellectual life of my university, Caltech, and merge temporarily with my own research group. It was a glorious year, at the pinnacle of what came to be called the Golden Age of Black Hole Research. During that year, Stephen and his students, and some of mine, struggled to understand black holes more deeply, as did I to some degree. But Stephen's presence and his leadership in our joint group's black hole research gave me freedom to pursue a new direction that I had been contemplating for some years. Gravitational waves. There are only two types of waves that can travel across the universe, bringing us information about things far away, 